Namaste. What's good, everybody? Welcome. It's Friday, and so let's be real. If you're over 30 and you're not getting dressed yet, you're not preparing to walk out that door in the next hour, let's face it, you're not going to be going out. You're going to be chilling at home, and you really have two options. The way I see it, it's either stay here, come chill and hang with me, let's talk some R, let's get our grown and sexy on, chill, have a little tea with this tea ceremony, have some good vibes and listen to this music, or an equally, an equally appealing option, granted, maybe, is to go check out some Netflix, right? You can, either, you can either chill with Omri or go chill with some Netflix. Well, let's see what's on Netflix right now, huh? Why don't we just see? <clears throat> let's see. Netflix, pull this up on the phone. All right, so you know that Netflix got this uh, top 10 list now, so you can see the top 10 shows in each country. And so, let's see. What's coming in at number 10? So, number 10, okay, <laughs> these are the top, 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 top shows on Netflix. So, number 10, look at that, you got Cop Out, and then you got uh, Space Jams, right? That's a classic, you know, that could be appealing, granted. And then what's that? Uh, Kung Fu Panda 2, that's coming in at number 8. That's solid. That could be a pretty solid watch, actually, so I'm not going to even... Uh, Hey, if you decide to go check that out instead of coming to chilling and hanging with me. Or you may want to watch, let's see, what's this? I'm not even sure what this is. I am not okay with this. Never even heard of that one, but you know, maybe good. Number six, Life as We Know It. Looks like a rom com family. Let's see, Freaks at number five, Altered Carbon. That's a, Never heard of that. That looks like a Netflix original. Coming in at number four. Number three, the Angry Birds movie. You can tell a lot of kids and stuff. Oh, number two. This one could be pretty heavy. I've seen some of the uh, previews from this, and I heard some people talking about this one. The uh, Trials of Gabriel Fernandez. I hear that's heartbreaking. I haven't watched it. It's in my queue. Uh, I may check that one out, too. And coming in at number one here is, uh, <laughs> what happens like that? Did you see that? Number one, Love is Blind. Looks like some reality, uh, some reality uh, show <laughs> on Netflix. But I could be wrong. So listen, if you decide to go hang at Netflix, totally get it. Gotcha. Understand. But if you want to come hang with me, have some grown folks kind of chill night, that is perfectly cool too. Look at this. I got the flute too, right? To set the atmosphere, to set the mood, right? So let's get started. Here we go. How that feel, right? Got that started. Now let's get the atmosphere going right we have the good sounds going got the flute now we're gonna get a little sage going on in our lives Ooh. okay crank up the sage here we go got that going purify this space because we need it right what a week it was right seriously so much happening in the news you hear all the corona stuff that's taking place so we're just going to take a moment to cleanse this space, right? Cleanse myself. <laughs> Ward it all off. Leave that. And then also, we're going to double down, right? We're going to get this Palo Santo wood going too. Here we go. Oh, there we go. You see that? So Palo Santo, this is the real deal. This is the, this is the legit. Okay, so we got our mood right, we got the music right, got the atmosphere right, the water is brewing, the tea.
let's get that ready and uh, let's clean some of these uh, items off that we want to use. I may have messed some stuff up. <laughs> I forgot to plug the mic in, so I don't even know if you heard any of the stuff that I was saying, so. <laughs> but I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. Okay, so we gotta cleanse the uh, stuff, right? Gotta get it right, gotta polish it all up. Boom, boom, boom. Teapot, get that all ready, nice and polished up for the tea ceremony. For our little sesh today. And then we got this. Got the cup, right? Get that going. Perfect. Right. And so down I'm gonna get the tea out. Get that ready. So tonight we're gonna be having some oolong tea, right? <clears throat> ah, that smells fresh. That smells really good. Right, so this is a oolong tea from Taiwan. It's loose leaf, um, partially oxidized, meaning that it's not quite uh, black tea, and it's in and it's uh, more oxidized than green tea. So right, it's right there in the middle. So we got that. I'll pull it up so you can get a good peek at it. This is the oolong that we're going to have tonight. Look at that, look at that. Nice, nice, nice. Okay. Next, we are going to take the oolong, right? Got this oolong, got it nice and fresh. This is gonna take a bath in the teapot, right? That's how this goes. The tea goes into the teapot. But before we do that, we gotta warm the teapot up, and we also got to uh, uh, warm the cup up, so that's important, right? Also, I gotta get the uh, little rinse jar because we gotta have something to pour all that stuff in. So let me go get the rinse jar real quick. Okay. So this is what I use to pour out all the stuff that we're not going to drink. So got to have that handy because we're going to need it. All right. Okay. So let me warm up this teapot. Get that nice and going. Let me warm up this cup. Got that going. Warm this all up. Okay, I'm gonna wait a little few seconds for it to heat up a little bit. All right. Wait one second. So I'm just getting my uh, screen set up real quick. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay, so this should be heated up by now. Right. 
that there. Nice. This is good. All right, so next the uh, leaves go into the teapot. Oh, I should be doing this this the other way so you can kind of see, right? Here we go. How's that look? Yeah, perfect, nice. Okay, so got all the leaves in there. And now we're gonna put some water in there just to open up the leaves, but not a lot because we're not gonna drink this first part. Okay. So this is just to heat it up a little bit, you know, cleanse the leaves, wash them off a bit. Nothing major. Right. And when we're ready, we simply pour this first part out. Because you don't drink the first pour. Right. Let me bring it back down. Check it out. Ah, uh, I can already smell them starting to open. That's going to be some good tea. <laughs> So this next pour is going to be the actual pour. Okay, here we go. Can you see this? All right, good. Here we go, nice. This is cool, this is legit. This second pour, this is the real deal. This is what we drink, let me make sure. It's looking good. I mean, it is steaming. Like, I don't know if you can see that steam. Can you see that steam? It is wafting off the top of this teapot. Okay. So, now that we got our, tea, our water boiling, we got our teacup ready, let me talk to you about what I'm gonna be talking about today. So, I was doing what I usually do on a Friday night. I'm over there stumbling through Sotheby's, looking at some art that uh, I really can't afford, right? And I happen to come across this artist uh, in one of their showings for modern and contemporary South Asian art. And it's an art piece by uh, Nazreen Mo. Hamadi. Now, when I was first looking at this piece, I was like, ah, oh, man, this is, this has a, like some good vibes to it, right? It, it just has a good mood to it. I like the kind of this muted color palette that I see. I like the, uh, I like the colors um, that are here in the center, this kind of teal and right here in the middle, there's this uh, dark, burgundy-ish color, right? And I like how it just kind of fades. And so I was kind of really drawn to this piece. I'm not really sure why, right? Like like any piece of art, you it 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 speaks to you if it does. And so this piece, it spoke to me. And um, so I wanted to learn more about the artist. And so uh, I began looking at some more of the uh, details around it. Let me see if the, let me check on the T, right? Let me see. Smelling good. It's almost ready. So, you put the strainer into the pitcher, right? That's how this goes. When you're ready, take the tea, pour it in. Can you see that? This is legit. Hmm. Check that out. Look at that. Look at the color. Look at the clarity. Look at that. This is good tea right here. This is legit tea. All right, so. Let me see. 
I'm gonna pour the tea in. I think we next song. Okay. So we got the tea, we're pouring it in. Okay, let's check it out. Ah, this is some good tea right here. Here we go. Let me blow it a little bit because it may be a little hot. Oh, that is scorching hot. Okay, let me try it. Mm, this is good. All right. You know when you drink your tea, you got to do your soul dance, right? That means you got to do a little rhythm. You got to do a little move. So you got to find your flow, right? You got to be like, hey, hey, <laughs> right? Okay, so. Mm. That's the first pour. Very solid. Very nice. Okay. I'm going to pour the second one and let it cool a bit. So I don't burn my tongue. Okay. So while that's cooling, let's get back to uh, let's get back to uh, Nazarene. So when I was going through this uh, catalog and I came across this piece that I was like, this looks nice, right? This looks pretty epic right here. Like I'm digging the colors. I'm digging the you know the gold, the teal, like just these uh, abstractions that, that was like, I kind of vibed with it for a moment, right? Because I'm really into uh, art and everything. So, you know, I went down a look and I was like, okay, look at painted circa 1963, oil on canvas, 47 by 35. I was like, cool. And then I read the uh, provenance, right? That's the, that's the fancy way of saying it's lineage, it's history. And so it says, acquired in Bombay through Keku Gundry by Peggy and Robert Matthews in 1963, gifted to the current owners in 2018. And I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. But this is where I got really sucked in. Like I got so pulled in because it started to kind of talk about the story of how it was acquired. And so it says, Peggy and Robert Matthews were world travelers and art collectors based in the United States. Peggy was a Midwest editor of Mademoiselle magazine based in Chicago. Robert, an executive in an office furniture business. Peggy and Robert met in Chicago at a May wine party and married nine months later. I was like, oh, look at that story. Look at that, you know, a little, little love story. I thought that was kind of, that was cool. And then it says, they enjoyed a busy life together pursuing their careers until 1962. Robert said, life is for the living. Let's quit our jobs and travel around the world. Like, isn't that what everybody dreams about? Isn't that what everybody hopes for one day is to be able to just be like, you know what? There's something more than this nine to fly, this nine to five, right? And something more than just clocking in every day, right? Life is for the living. And so that sentiment, it really resonated within me. Um, because sometimes I feel like I get caught up in the daily grind and I forget that seriously, life is for living, right? To be experienced, to be savored, to be enjoyed. And, um, and sometimes I can lose sight of that. And so seeing this, it just, it was just this stark reminder that oh, this was good. And so it said they quit their jobs and tr and so it says he left his job which he probably couldn't stand you know he was selling office furniture and he was like oh i gotta do something more with my life there's something more meaningful out there and peggy took a leave of absence from mademoiselle now that must have been a pretty cool, cool gig to be the midwest editor right of mademoiselle over there being like the taste maker for all of the midwest from her perch up in chicago I think that must have been a good, good gig. But it says, 
They spend months traveling across the world to exotic destinations, including the Middle East, India, Pakistan, Cambodia, Japan, and Thailand. Now that sounds like a whirlwind adventure, right? Like if you are going to leave your job, you probably want to hit that up, right? Middle East, India, Pakistan, uh, Cambodia, Japan, Thailand. Sounds like a tremendous adventure, like just some great growth right there, like expansive way to live. And then it says, it was in December in 1963 that they met gallerist Keiku Gandhi. Oh, no, Keiku Gandhi and Nazreen Mohimedi in Bombay and acquired this work, an everlasting curiosity about the world, its people, and a love for travel was something they shared throughout their 50-year married life. What? Can you imagine that? Being married for 50 years? Now, listen, the tea is cool, so grab it. So you gotta know the official way to hold the tea. Now, and I learned this when I was at the high tea room in Vancouver, of all places. Dude, sitting there like a total G. Everybody else had their hand gripped on the handle. This dude, bam, index, top, rim, thumb, base. This is how you hold your teacup, right? This is the G way of doing it. Like, this is the legit, this is the lit way of doing it. And so, listen to this. They had a love for travel and were married 50 years, right? Can you imagine that, being married 50 years? Namaste to that. Hmm. Hmm. It says their art collection was a culmination of their respective interests. They brought, they bought what they each liked and ranged uh, from Renaissance to modern art. Hmm. Hmm. Whew. That tea was good right there. So, just hearing the story behind the painting, right? I mean, the painting, it caught my eye, right? I was like, this is interesting. This is intriguing. There's something alluring about it. But then, it was that deeper dive, right? It was that deeper look into the story behind it that really kind of captured it for me. And I was like, oh, this is good. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, all right, all right, all right. Okay. So we're going to get some more water pouring into these leaves. They're already starting to open, smelling delicious. Can you see that? Opening up really nicely. Okay. Here we go. So it says, Nasreen Mohimedi is celebrated today as a pioneer of a form of minimalist abstract art born in India, born in Karachi. Wait, abstract art in India, born in Karachi. Uh, Mohimedi trained at St. Martin's School of Art in London from 1954 to 57. She returned to India shortly thereafter, becoming part of a community of artists, musicians, theater directors, and others working from the Baal-Abhi-Desi? Institute in Bombay from 1958 
onward. Now, isn't that the kind of like, I just kind of get so sucked into these kind of stories where it's someone living this kind of bohemian, artsy, free will in lifestyle where they're just all monks, all these artists and all these musicians and poets and free thinkers and scholars. Like that just seems like such a solid environment to be in. And um, there she was and she studied and um, let's see, let me skip down. Okay. Like uh, Gaitonde Mohimedi had an interest in Zen, mysticism, and the element non-Platonic thought. And he became a mentor. Now, that kind of resonated with me because when I graduated college, right, and I was kind of wandering around like, what am I going to do right before I got my first job, right after college? I went and practiced Zen as well, right? I was sitting there in the Zendo and just like wondering like, what is my life about, right? What is it going to be about? And uh, what am I going to be doing? And so in Zen, it says... You don't have to know, right? It says you just sit. You sit and you be with the experience, whatever the experience is. You notice your mind. You know it's going to do whatever it wants to do. It's going to have fear and worry and doubt and project, but you sit through it all. And at the end, you get back up. And when you get up, you get back up with a greater sense of awareness. You get back up with a greater sense of depth and connection. And so it just seems like there's this through line to certain people in their lives, right? That she went and studied Zen and mysticism. In my life, I went and studied, studied Zen and I went to study these uh, shamanic traditions, right? I went to go study, uh, I went to go backpack through Central America and meet the shamans and go to the cloud forest and all that, right? And so it's just, it's just very interesting how this all works out. And so, it says, in these years, Mohimedi briefly explored a linear expression and figure, though she was never interested in representational likeness, right? She wasn't, she didn't want to make realistic art, right? She wanted it, she, she didn't want it to represent something, Right? It was about the feel, it was about the mood, it was about the mysticism, the zen of it all. And that's something that I think is the understory why this really resonates with me, right? Because it's about, um, it's about the zen, right? So, mm. so dance time, wait a minute. All right, <laughs> let me calm down. Okay, here we go. Mm. That is good though, okay. So it says, eh, let's see. There was another good part that I thought was worthwhile. Let me see if I can find it. One second. One second. Oops, sorry. Okay. Okay, back, 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 back. I had to take a... Mm. 
Got these Friday night chill vibes going on here. Okay, wait a minute. So let's see. It says, Mohimedy's uh, abstraction has often been linked to Western minimalism and to an Islamic aesthetic of abstraction. As she was born Muslim and the Zahra, and with Zarina Hazmi and Rumana Hussein, among the first few trailblazing Muslim women to establish careers as professional artists in India and abroad in this period. Like, Mohimedy was a true trailblazer, right? She's over there living the bohemian life, surrounded by artists and musicians and poets and, and thinkers. And then she created a whole profession, right? She, she willed it into being before it was even really a thing, right? And I think that that's, a, that's another reason why um, this art you know, really resonated with me. And that's the thing about art a lot of times. It's, it's not just about the piece. It's knowing the story behind the piece. I will say that over and over. The story behind the piece sometimes makes the artwork that much more profound, right? You see this and you like, you know what? I can go to Pier 1 and go see something like this, right? I can go... I can go to... Uh, Target and see something like this. I can go to uh, Cost Plus World Market and see something like this, right? You know, because that's kind of in style. It's kind of in, it, this is kind of the style of things, right? This abstraction, these minimalist colors, and um, these tonal elements to it. That's kind of the art that we're used to seeing. But knowing that this right here was the result of Someone who was one of the first women in the Islamic tradition to have these kind of professional careers like this. That's something that's, that's really intriguing. And um, just the story of, of, the, of the purchasers as well, the providence of Peggy and Robert and them deciding like life is for living, right? I just think that that's so cool. Right there. So let's see. Hmm. And the fact that she liked uh, Zen mysticism and all that, and she was hanging out with all the artists and everything. That's just cool. Okay. And so it says uh, Mohimedy's abstractions arise from a deeply individual questioning of consciousness nothingness and the void. Now that is straight out of Zen, right? This concept of emptiness, of nothingness. This is beautiful. You can definitely see that kind of questioning in her work of art. And it says that um, in this way, a lifelong desire to reduce her work to the, its essence also departs significantly from the central ethos of Euro-American minimalism, which grew largely out of formalist preoccupations, particularly a rejection of the gestures of abstract expressionism and handmade object. The inadequacy of these explorations to understand Mohimedy's work underscores the complexity, finesse, and exceptionality of her practice, including vis-a-vis -vis the extended predominance that the figure had among artists in India through Mohimedy's life. I'm like, I am through, right? That was like, now that's an ending right there. You want to talk about uh, having like a true climax and denouement? That right there nailed it. Southern bees, they always know how to tell a story, right? They always know how to draw you in, right? This right here. Let me read that uh, last part again because that, that, was, uh, that was just rich. It was just so full of everything. It says, Mohimedy's abstraction 
arises from a deeply individual questioning of consciousness, nothingness, and the void. In this way, a lifelong desire to reduce her work to its essence also departs significantly from the central ethos of Euro-American minimalism, which grew largely out of formalist preoccupations, particularly a rejection of the gestures of abstract expressionism and handmade objects. The inadequacy of these explanations to understand Mohammedi's work underscores the complexity, finesse, and exceptionality of her practice, including vis-a-vis -vis the extended predominance that the figure had among artists in India throughout Mohammedi's life. Cheers to that. Whatever it meant, <laughs> it sounded good. <laughs> Namaste. Mm. That's, we got our tea going, we got our mood going, we got our vibe going. I'm gonna have to use that phrase, including vis-a-vis -vis the extended predominance that the figure had among artists. That's like a mic drop moment, right? That's where you just go, <laughs> including vis-a-vis -vis the extended predominance, right? That just shuts down anything else. That's solid, that's rich, that's real. All right, you see the leaves, they open it up a little bit more, okay? Pouring the water in, getting the tea going. What is this, round three? Round three, here we go, round three. Boiling, keep it going, round three. Okay. Okay, the inadequacy of these explanations. <laughs> These are be the extended predominance. Whew. That's major. Okay, so then I went to Wikipedia to look up a little bit more. Because right, you know, to, as soon as you want to learn a little bit more about something, you get onto the nearest off ramp, and that's Wikipedia. Right? I was an Indian-born artist known for her line-based drawings and is today considered one of the most essential modern artists from India, right? That's her like opening sentence and talked about um, how her work was being received and the places it was at, the Museum of Modern Art, the uh, Kiran Nadar Museum, and the uh, Kassel and the Talwar Gallery. And so I started to explore a little bit more of her artwork and then I started to see what this line work that they were talking about because I kept hearing these like lines, this kind of tessellation of patterns. And so I saw some of it and I'm like, oh, this is cool. Like, this is, I'm like, I'm vibing with this. This really was like, just this, uh, it was vis-a-vis. -vis. Wait a minute, what, how do I describe this? Let me see. This is described as, um, the inadequacy of these, so I can't really explain this, because the inadequacy of these explanations to understand Mohammedi's work underscores the complexity, finesse, and exceptionality of her practice, including vis-a-vis -vis the extended predominance. That applies to this, vis-a-vis -vis these line drawings. Because they have finesse, wait, what does it say? It has complexity, finesse, and exceptionality, right? Complexity, finesse, and exceptionality, including vis-a-vis -vis the predominance. You just need to 
You just need to slurp that up a little bit and like just sit in there, <laughs> marinate in that for a moment. But look at this. I mean, it's it's cool, right? This is like this is like solid. Oh, I forgot. I'm not supposed to touch my face, right? We, I don't know if you guys heard like all the uh, COVID-19 things. You're not supposed to touch your face and everything. So got to remember like not to do that. All right. So um, let me pour this tea out. Oh, oops. I was supposed to pour it into the pitcher. Why didn't you guys remind me? I'm over here messing up. I think it's because I'm so uh, like into the uh, description vis-a-vis -vis the extended predominance <laughs> all right okay so let me go so i started looking up the artist on twitter right and so uh look at this celebrating the indian woman uh nita and beanie powers uh Nazreen Mohammadi across India's Twitterati. Mm -hmm, like this. Oh, she was exhibited at the uh, at the Met. Uh, look at that. What was that? 2016. Oh, so I'm a few years too late, right? I'm, I'm kind of like really big popping, but I'll look at some of these works. These are pretty cool. Nice, nice, nice. Okay, okay. I'm digging it. I like the vibe. I like that, I like that. Cool. Mm. Let's see. Don't miss. So she's among a lot of these. Oh, look at that. That's cool. Oh, wow. Nice. Hmm. So a lot of uh, a lot of art uh, closing soon. Noreen Mohammadi's Au revoir, is that how you say that? Oh. Adds a rich layer to the history of South Asian art. Are you vibing with this? Like you like this? I mean, it looks pretty cool to me. I uh, I like this. It's cool. Mm. Check some of these out. Let's see. Oh, oh, look at that. Hmm. Look at him. When he said in 2016, looking forward, he looking too forward to the exhibit. I know he was. That looks good. A monographic exhibition of Indian modernist artist Nazreen Mohimidi opens today. Look at this. Look at these. These. I mean, you can tell they have the form of like a flower-like shape, right? And let me get some more tea, right? Let me get this tea going. There we go. Okay. Let me get the grip going. Right, got the proper grip. This is good. Okay, let me see. So is this like a, is this a photo? Or let me see. Friday, play with the lines in space, right? Okay, I do get this concept of lines and space here, right? In the middle, running through, you have this um, cascading or undulating line, right? You have the wave patterns in the sand, and then you have the wave patterns in the uh, in the lake or the body of water, right? I can see this interplay of what did it say of line and space, right? There's a clear delineation in space. You have the water formation of top, you have the land formation of the bottom, 
and they kind of meet in the middle, right? They kind of form that yin yang kind of symbol right there, right there in the middle, right there. And uh, you kind of, I'm vibing with that. I like that. That looks cool. Okay. Let's see. Are there some other ones that I want to check out? And you see, this is one thing that Indian art is really known for its, you know, use of uh, color and its very decorative forms. And you can really tell or contrast that with um, Mohimedy style, which is, you know, really uh, clean, uh, clear lines, not muted color palette. Um, really experiencing form and space and line. Yeah, you can, I can really tell that, so. Oh, is this Mohammedi? Let me see. Who is Nasir Mohammedi? Oh, look at this, this is her. Look at that, imagine that, the 1960s in India, you have your canvases laid out on the wall, surrounded, you have all the artists, you have the poets and everything. I think that's really so cool. That's just such a cool way, right? Let's just soak this in for a moment. Cheers. Okay. That's why I always like to be around people who are very creative, like these artists, you know, whether they're programmers or fine artists or musicians, because they just, see the world in these very clear ways. I like that. All right. Hey, more. Look at this. Lots. Of, you can definitely see the lines. Look at that. That interplay of lines. This work is solid. I'm really, the more I see um, Mohimedi's work, Nazarene Mohimedi's work, the more I am falling into it, you know, the more I'm getting excited about it, right? This is like serious. And it all started because I was browsing through those Sotheby streets, you know, and we know how those Sotheby streets can be. And I saw this image, right? I saw this painting that really spoke to me, right? It really said, hello, right? And that's how I feel. Like, it was like, hey, you know, because there's so many other paintings that I was browsing through, and this one was like, hey, and I was like, hey. <laughs> and the painting was like, how you doing? And I was like, I'm good, how you doing? And so, me and the painting, we had like this exchange, we had this moment. I was like, I like your lines. And the painting was like, what about my form? And I was like, you know, I dig that too, you know? <laughs> So there's a real um, there's a real appreciation for this painting that I had, and then like I said, reading the story behind it, right? Reading this story about uh, Peggy Lee and Robert Matthews and this life. Oh, look at this. I'm gonna put this right here at the top so you can see. Life is for living. Let's quit our jobs and travel the world. You can just imagine. You know, I just imagine. You know, Peggy and Robert. They have this like. This life, they're living this luxe life. She's the editor at this ma magazine. He's this executive at a furniture company. And, you know, he was like, darling, darling, my darling Peggy, my snookums Peggy. You know, I just imagine him as being like, I don't know if you know um, Thurston Howell from uh, Gilligan's Island, but he had that voice, love, darling, darling. Yeah, I could just imagine him, you know, sitting in his like smoking jacket or something in their Chicago um, home being like, darling, my darling Peggy, life is for living. Let's quit our jobs and travel the world. And, you know, Peggy was like, my dearest Robert, of course, I will travel the world with you. Where shall we go? And then I can imagine uh, Robert looking around at his globe, because he probably had a globe in his office. 
And he was thinking Paris. And Peggy was like, no, not Paris. And then they were like, Sydney. He was like, no, not Sydney. And then they were like, Rome. No, not Rome. Did that too many times. Let's go on a true adventure, my love. Let's go live life. Let's go to the Middle East, India, Pakistan, Cambodia, Japan, Thailand, a world of exotic destinations. And Peggy said, I am leaving the Midwest and we shall travel the world. Right? And it's just like, That is just such, I mean, that story right there, it just kind of sunk into me. And, you know, that they were married 50 years. Okay, okay, so this is the part that I want to get to. So there was an exchange of letters that are included in the sale of this, right? And listen, if you want it, you only have nine days left. I, and look at it. USD, 200 to 300,000 USD. Listen. If I had two to three hundred thousand just laying around, I would definitely be like, you know what? Given this, this is worth hanging on my wall. But with the story that's behind it, wait, okay, if the painting is worth two hundred thousand, the story alone is worth another hundred thousand. The story makes it worth that three hundred thousand. I think it should go on the higher end just because of the story. Even though it's untitled, this story right here, this whole story that I read, this uh, this uh, story of uh, Peggy and Robert Matthews, who traveled the world, and Robert who said, life is for the living. Let's quit our jobs and travel the world. Snookums, right? That is, that's so interesting, right? And then the places that they went, they're just like, he was like, I'm not doing the pedestrian. We're not going to Canada. We're not going to Niagara. We are going to India. We're going to Japan. Right? I just think that's really cool. And um, then, like I said, this ending right here, the way they end, this ending alone is worth a good 15000 Right? Because the way, I mean, it's like lights out. Right? This ending right here. Okay. Let me read it one more time. The inadequacy of these. No, no. I need to go back. One little. Let me see. I got to get this other part. There we go. Particularly, a rejection of the gestures of abstract expressionism and handmade objects. The inadequacy of these explanations to understand Mohimedy's work underscores the complexity, fineness, finesse, and exceptionality of her practice including vis-a-vis -vis the extended predominance that a figure had among artists in India throughout Mohammed's life. Right. So, look at this. Uh, this letter. So this is a letter that Mohammed wrote Peggy. Look at that. So December 30th is when it was written. And so Mohimedy is the artist. Peggy was the buyer. And it says, ah, let me get some more. Let's see. What is this? Round four? Okay, we'll get this water going for round four. Leaves. Leave check. Leaves are good. Okay. Got the water. Okay. Okay, it says, so this is uh, Nazarene Mohimedy writing Peggy. And while the water, while the tea steeps, I'll read this. It says, 
Dear Peggy, I have taken a few days to send you that, but I am sure it will reach you before you get there. I love her, uh, I don't know if these are like commas, like the way she draws these lines is like, like an extended period or like, or it's, maybe it is an M dash or a dash, but they're, they're kind of lower and I just kind of like that. It just says, okay, okay. Reach you before you get there, we hope, right? So, oh, I guess she's talking about sending the painting. Uh, oh yes, okay, so this is, this is the actual letter talking about sending the painting, all right? That's so cool. That it'll reach her uh, before you get there, I hope, all right, with an exclamation point. And then it says, I'm trying to work, but most unsuccessfully. I suppose their periods have to come, right? And so uh, that's just like such a thing about life. Even then, even back then, she was having like her writer's block, just like everybody today, right? We go through these periods, right? Where just are blocked. And Mohammedy was talking about that in her. She was like, I've been trying to work, but most unsuccessfully. I suppose there are periods that have to come, right? Like, I guess these blocks just are part of life. Like there was this recognition there. There's just this profound recognition. But then she goes, ah, yes. Right, isn't that, just, that's such an artist thing to do, to say, right? Ah, yes, to just put that into words, into the writing. That's like serious, that's so legit. Okay, wait a minute. Okay, we got the tea. Let's uh, get the strainer. I almost forgot that last time. Y'all let me forget, but not this time. Okay, here we go. Catching this, let me, you got that? You see this? Here we go. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Dear Peggy, oh, wait a minute. Okay, so I read that part. Let me go down. It says, ah, yes, that's where I left off on, right? That. I mean, because I had an art history teacher when I was in school, and she would go, ah, right? <laughs> Lila Staples, that was her name. Lila Staples, she was head of the museum. I could imagine her being just like Peggy or being just like Mohammedy, just this artist, like feeling life and just sucking it all in, right? Okay, so let's get back to the letter. It says, ah, yes, I wanted to tell you about my signature, right? Oh, okay, oh, this is getting good. Okay, let's hear about the signature. It says, um, I feel that the signature on the painting hinders with the form, and so I put it on the back. Oh, <laughs> I'm sure Peggy, okay, so I get it, I get it, I get it. So let me explain that. So Peggy probably saw the painting, was like, I like this painting, let's, let's get it, let's get it, right? And then she was like, can we get it signed? And, uh... Uh, Mohammedy was probably like, oh yeah, yeah, I'll sign it for you. But then in her little note, she was just like, listen, I didn't really want to put it in the front. Like, I don't really want to mess up this work of art. This right here, this is something special. I'm just going to slide it on the back. And which probably wasn't what Peggy was expecting. Peggy was probably like, listen, I want this signature on here because I'm going to go back to Chicago. I'm going to go back to Mademoiselle and say, I got this and I need a signature on it. I didn't get this from Pier 1. I don't, all of you guys who try to copy it, right? All these artists that are going to see this, they're going to try to copy it. I want a signature on there to say, this is the original. This is the authentic thing, right? <laughs> but Mohammed, he was like, mm. Right, she was doing her artist kind of thing. She was like, it interferes with the form, 
Right. <laughs> it hinders with the form. Maybe that's something like a thing I need to say to somebody too when they're getting on my nerves. Like, listen, you're hindering with my form. Back up. Don't hinder my form. <laughs> Go to the back. <laughs> you're hindering my form. <laughs> <laughs> mm. okay. Let's see. Need a little more in there. Okay. Let's uh, get the uh, atmosphere right again. Get the sage going again. Cleanse this space again. Okay. Mm. Mm. <sighs> okay. So let's finish reading this story. <laughs> okay. Where did I leave? Off? Okay. It hinders the form. I put the signature on the back, Peggy, because it hinders the form. Okay. I will be with my family. Let me see. What did she say? Uh, hinders the form. Okay, hinders the form. So I put it on the back. Okay, I will be with my friend in Turkey. Is that what it says? Turkey. <laughs> That's great. You know what? This is kind of how artists and rich people talk. Like they talk about conversations that they had in a new location, right? They, like, that has to be part of the conversation. Where they are, right? <laughs> and they're like, listen, I will be in Turkey talking to my friend. And I'm definitely going to start using these dashes, like extra long dashes in my letters, right? Even though she has really nice handwriting, but I'm going to, I want to start using that, right? And then I got to say where, even though I won't be in like exotic places, like I won't be able to say like, I'm going to be in Turkey this week and I'll be in Istanbul this week and I'll be in, I mean, no, not Istanbul, that is in Turkey, but like I'm going to be in Prague the next week and I'm going to be in Nairobi the next week, you know? Like probably like she's saying, I'll probably like, I'm in LA this week, maybe I'll be in, Westwood the next week, and <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll be in downtown. Like, I'm gonna start putting where I am in the city in text messages, right? I'm gonna be like, listen, I got your message. I'm in downtown. I may have to get back to you when I'm on the west side, all right? Like, or listen, I'm in the South Bay. When I get back downtown, I will get back to you. <laughs> like, I'm going to start putting the destination for where I'm going or where I'm at in my text messages with this giant dash in tribute to Mohimedy. Nazreen, I am just going to channel your artist vibe right here. <laughs> and I'm definitely going to use that Listen, you wanted this work. I'm going to put it on the back side of my to-do list because it's really hindering my form, right? It's, it's, it's hindering my form. Okay, let me pull this up. Okay. This is, I'm telling you, these letters, they're just chock full of just like, Artist isms like this is so how they speak. This is like I can so see this with these kind of gallerists and the art people today. Like they always talk about where they are and their travels. Like right? that is a part of the conversation. Like, listen, I remember I was somewhere. Well, who was I talking to? Oh, so much. she was like, I'm in London. I cannot possibly. <laughs> Wait, I've just been on a nine hour flight from London. I'll be in Paris and I can't possibly get back to you. I'll call you when I land in Dubai. <sighs> this is kind of what uh, Mohammed was doing right here. She was, first of all, she was telling Peggy, no, I'm not really going to put the signature on the front. I know we probably agreed to that, but that's not really happening because it's messing with the form. <laughs> And then it says, um, 
So I put it on the back and it says, I will be with my friend in Turkey, but by the time you get this, you would have met her. I, uh, it was in, indeed nice meeting you all. And do I hope we will be able to again. My heart wishes to Mr. Matthew affectionately. Um, Nasir, Nasin uh, Mohammedi. P.S. I will be coming to you. Um, isn't that just a way of just like ending a letter, right? Affectionately. Affectionately. Right? All you could be, you know, that's just the way to end something right there. You know, you, instead of saying, like, all right, take care, deepest wishes, uh, thanks, better that, affectionately. Right? There's just this tenderness to the way artists speak, right? It is like a soul bearing way, it is like infused with empathy and love. It's nothing cold. It's just like, it's like, affectionately means like, that's like a hug, right? That's the way to hug in a letter, right? Affectionately. Nasreen. Mohammadi. Right? And just the line before it, um, it was indeed nice meeting you. I do hope we will be able to do it again. My heart wishes to. Right? Isn't that a beautiful thing to hear? Wouldn't that be a beautiful thing to receive? Like, I hope we're able to meet again. My heart wishes to. That is beautiful. That is beautiful, right? Mm. Ah, okay. So, okay, let's see. So close that out. Okay. So what do we say? Okay, so some takeaways from this, right? When you have something, when somebody wants you to do something, you may have to tell them, listen, I'm going to slide this to the back side because I don't want it to interrupt my form, <laughs> right? Like, you need to take this request and place it on the back because you are not interrupting my form, right? That is like, that is legit, right? That is first of all legit. So that's the one takeaway. The second takeaway, these giant M dashes, like, these are the best kind of punctuation. Like, there's nothing more satisfying than this to me visually. Because a period, that does, just doesn't do enough, right? You have an exclamation point that, you know, really exclaims. You have a period that just kind of, you know, punches it in. But this dash, this lowered M dash, this is legit, right? <laughs> that just like... It's like a transitional, right? It's like it carries one thing to another. It separates the ideas, right? Like, where did it say? I have taken a few days in sending you this, right? But I am sure it will reach you before you get there. We hope. <laughs> an artist like thing okay okay and then the other thing the other takeaway was um i will be meet uh, i will be with my friend in turkey but by the time you get this you would have met right isn't that just putting the location of things into the conversation. I think that that's such 
a key takeaway. Even in your text messages, right? Your text messages, as I said, just put where you're at, like the location. Listen, uh, I'm in the valley. I'll get back to you when I'm out near the beach. <laughs> Something like that. That's it. <clears throat> I'm in Echo Park, but when I reach Venice, we can chat. <laughs> I, I don't know why I get it. That to me is so interesting. Okay. But anyway. Okay. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Okay, so that was Nazreen's uh, letter to Peggy on December 30th, 1963, right? Okay. And the response from Peggy, oh, look at that. She put it on the Mademoiselle stationery, right? She made it official. She was like, oh, let me send this back. <laughs> Uh, that is the one thing about emails is that they don't have this kind of station. Emails should have like official, legit stationery. Like Gmail, when I send an email at the top, instead of that to from, it should have this nice heading. I don't know if I can highlight it here. No, it doesn't highlight. Uh, but it says like, you see how it says right here? Oh, where'd it go? Oh, there it goes. Uh, Mademoiselle, 65 East South Water Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60601, state 2-4780. Hmm, that's interesting. I wonder what that state means, but it goes, uh, uh, Ms. Nasreen Mohimedy, care of... Asraf Brothers, Bahrain, Arabian Gulf. Isn't that some Bahrain, Arabian Gulf? That just sounds like, ah, well, just to be able to send an international letter like that, isn't that kind of nice? Let me get some more tea. Let me get this tea going. What is this, round five? All right. Okay. So we are in round five. Okay. Ooh. All right. <clears throat> okay. Letting that brew. Okay. So where were we? Okay. So we're reading the letter. So we read the letter from Nazreen to Peggy, and now Peggy is writing back to Nazreen on Mademoiselle Stationery to her care of the Azroth brothers in Bahrain, Arabian Gulf, right? That just sounds like something epic right here. Like, I have to draft this letter to the Arabian Gulf, right? That's legit. Like, if you are talking to someone in Dubai, in Qatar, right? That is like serious dealings, right? Okay. So let's read what the letter says from Peggy. What did Peggy say? I'm going to try it in my best Peggy voice. All right, here's where I go. Dear Nasreen, thank you so much for your letters of December 30th and February 21st. Oh, they sent two letters. So we only got to read the one. We didn't get to read the second letter. We didn't get to read the February 22nd, 21st letter. That's interesting. She said two letters. All right. Uh, now I'm curious about what the second letter said. Okay. But anyway, it says, okay. Thank you so much for the letters of December 30th and February 21st. I am terribly sorry about my delay in answering. We didn't arrive back in the United States until the end of February. And I immediately started back to work. That, coupled with trying to get unpacked and settled in from our trip, has caused delay in my reply. 
<laughs> that is so like what you know people always use like the travel as the thing like listen you can't really be mad at me because I was traveling like travel is like the best kind of excuse right in staying like I really couldn't do this because I was traveling like that is like an acceptable form of why stuff couldn't happen right because I was I was traveling and then I was unpacking and then I was settling in and then I had to go do something else but I am doing this now right and it's like ah I understand. Right? If someone just told me, like, you were late. Like, I was late, but I was late because I was just on a 14-hour flight from Sydney. And I'd be like, oh, okay. Well, yeah, you probably need to adjust, right? Time change and everything. You know, jet lag. All right, I got it. Chill. <laughs> but, okay. Peggy goes on to say, we love seeing your handwriting. And most of all, we loved getting word from TWA that our painting had arrived. We love it just as much as when we purchased it from you on Christmas Eve. Oh, isn't that special? Christmas Eve in, where are they? In the Arabian Gulf? I don't know where they purchased. Oh, she was from India, but maybe she was, well, she, she's in Bahrain. She was in the Arabian Gulf, right? Can you imagine that? Christmas Eve in Bahrain in the Arabian Gulf? Wow. It's interesting. It says, we love it just as much as when we purchased it on Christmas Eve. Okay. We have not had it stretched as yet, but it seems to have come through intact. Yes, darling. It is all intact. Okay, it says, Mr. Matthews. Isn't that something? She refers to, uh, she doesn't refer to him as Jim. What was his name? Was it Jim? I can't remember if his name was Jim. Let me see if it was Jim. Let me see. It was Robert. Was it Robert? Peggy? Robert. It was Robert. Yeah, Robert Matthews. She said, Mr. Rob Matthews. Not, not Robert. Okay. That was very formal. Okay, let's see. Okay. Mr. Matthews and I were not able to see your friend in Istanbul as there had been a very bad snowstorm. Oh, wow. Snowstorm in Istanbul? I didn't even know it snowed there. Shows you what I know. Okay. And we only stayed in the city for one day. We will have to return to Turkey someday when weather and political conditions are better. Oh, it must have been like some something going on, right? <laughs> Peggy, Peggy told Robert, it is time to continue our travels. They were like, we are not staying here. <laughs> we are not. Stand here. <laughs> we could only stay for one day. <laughs> oh my gosh. They were probably looking around and it seemed a little politically unstable in Istanbul that day. And they were just like, you know what, Robert, we need to go. <laughs> and Robert was like, yes, yes, Peggy, I agree. We need to go. One day is all we need. Okay. All right. And so then it goes on to say, the painting did cost a great deal of money to send, but we are very happy with it and want to reimburse whoever paid for the shipping as soon as you tell us whether we should pay you or Miss... Vina Dalla at SITA World Travel. We will send the proper check. As nearly as we could figure in the United States dollars, it will come to $17.85. Can you imagine that being a great deal of money? Right? $17.85. I wonder how much that is in U.S. dollar. Like, like I mean, inflation calculator. Let me see. Let me see what 
Let me see what the inflation on that would be. $17.85. Let's remember that. Okay. Okay, if in, let's see, how does this go? Okay, if in entry year 1963, was it? Okay, we want $17.85 in 2020, calculate. That item would cost $150.48. Cumulative inflation, 743%. Wow, can you imagine that? So it would be a great deal of money, right, if it cost $150 to, to ship something, right? Wow, $17, like $18 was worth $150. That's insane. That's wild, right? Okay, let's continue with the letter. It says, does that agree with your figures? We hope you are having a delightful time visiting your father in Bahrain. Are you going to live there now until your marriage? Wow, look at that. I hope you are having a delightful time visiting your father in Bahrain. Are you going to live there until your marriage? Mm. It says, Mr. Matthews joins me in wishing you the best and wants to convey his own pleasure in having your painting. Please drop us a note so that we can get the shipping charges taken care of. With warmest personal regards, Mademoiselle Peggy Henry Matthews, Midwest Editor. P.S. We loved meeting you and hope that you will be able to come to the United States sometimes. It says, <sighs> Now, if that isn't just satisfying, let me just take a moment to just soak that all in. delicious. Okay. So. Okay, let me see. What was next? Okay, so we looked at some of uh, Peggy's work. I'm not Peggy, but um, Nasreen's work on Twitter, right? Saw the line. It's all the post about it. We, we've taken in some of the um, exchanges in the letter. Oh, look at this, Nasreen. Hello, Nasreen. We adore your work. Absolutely stunning work. Well done. Well done. Okay. 
Okay, so let's continue on. So, Nazarene New York was shown at the Met. Look at this. In uh, 2016. 2016. Well, let's read what this catalog has to say. It says, Ex Exhibition Overview. One of the most significant artists to emerge in post-independence India, Nasreen Mohimadi, 1937 to 1990. Wow, what a life there. Created a body of work that demonstrates a singular and sustained engagement with abstraction. Her minimalist practice not only adds to a rich layer to the history of South Asian art, but also necessitates an expansion of the narratives of international modernism. Whew. Now that's a line right there, right? Here we go. It necessitates an expansion of the narratives of international modernism. I concur. I couldn't agree more. <sighs> okay. Mm. Okay, let's see. Mm. Okay, and then it has a uh, some of her work in this video, that was pretty cool. Okay. Then look at this, Nasreen Mohimadi. So these are artworks by the artist that are, um, I think these are works that are already, that are currently on offer, like different ones. So this one bidding is closed, but look at this. Yeah, that's pretty cool, right? I like that. I like that. I like that. It has that kind of lo-fi kind of feel to it. Doyle, purse, post-war, contemporary, bidding clothes. Okay. Let's see. The bidding is closed on uh, this one as well, but let's check out this one. This is um, one of her lines and spaces. Uh, you can really tell that. So uh, look at this, black and white photograph, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Oh, that's pretty cool. I like this one. I actually do like this one. I've seen this one before. And I liked it. I saw it before as well. Nasreen Mohimadi. This one's at the Tate. Look at that. This is on loan. When is LA going to get some of her work? Let me see if are they all at the Met? Now, how come LACMA doesn't have uh, her work? LACMA, y'all need to step up. And get some Nasreen Mohimedy or um, or Mocha. Mocha? Or even um, Broad? Broad? Where do you, got, or do you guys have some? How come none of these say uh, LA museums? <laughs> we got to get our culture game up. <laughs> Let me see. Right. Nope. Yeah, no, no works for a bid now. Now, oh, look at all these. Huh. You gotta log in to see estimates. Oh, I don't even know if I have an artsy account. <laughs> Guess I won't be uh, seeing the prices of these. I know they're going to be pretty pricey because if this one is, what was it? This one, if this one, 
selling at Sotheby's for two hundred to three hundred thousand. This one, you know, these other ones are going to be a little more pricey. Whew. Oh, God, this is so nice. I mean, after hearing this whole story, right? After hearing Nazarene's story, after hearing about Peggy and Robert, about leaving it all and saying, life is for living, right? Like, that is the way to live. Let's go travel the world. Love. Let's go travel the world. That's epic. Okay. Okay. Let me see. What else do we have? Yeah. So I think that about wraps up our time we'll do one more cup of tea and we'll just take in the flavors of Nasreen's work and um you know maybe you will decide like ah oh, yes i need to see this on my wall like this work by Nasreen Mohimedi after hearing these letters, right? That story alone, or that life philosophy alone for Peggy and Robert, the letter exchange between Nasreen and Peggy, that alone is worth the price. Like, that alone <laughs> is worth the price. Seriously. Okay. Let me pour this last batch out. Last batch out. Last batch, last batch, last batch. Um. Okay. Let me see. If everything is okay. Life is for the living. Life is for living. Namaste. Time for a soul dance.
Okay. All right. Okay. All right, all right, all right. So, if you're going to this Sotheby's auction, nine days, Nasreen Mohimedi, two to three hundred thousand. Catalog note. Such a feeling of space, open, intense green, black, strong, glitting wires creating drama as one moves along, patterns of gray, drops of intersecting. Mohimedi extracts from Nasreen Mohimedi's dyer's drawing space, Contemporary Indian Drawing, Institute of Visual Arts. Oh, so that's, is, is that a poem from her, oh, from her diaries? Oh, okay, 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 okay. So that's what we should be drawing from this. Okay, feeling of space, openness, intense green, black, strong, gliding wires, creating drama as one moves along, patterns of gray, drops of intersecting. Oh, such a feeling of space, open, intense green. Ah, now it kind of makes sense. Feelings of space, open, wide. Doesn't this feel open and wide? Like, it, it, it has this sense of being open. It does have this sense of expansiveness to it. It does have this quality of openness to it. Does it appeal to you? Would you see this hanging on your wall? Like, literally. Like, in all honesty. And if so, which room? Like, this kind of feels like a dining room piece. I don't quite know if it feels like a living room. Right, to me. I don't think this is living room. This is like dining room. Or foyer, foyer, foyer. Right, it's like an entry. Right, because it does have an invitational quality to it. It does feel open. It does feel spacious. And, um, but it doesn't necessarily seem like focal, right? It doesn't necessarily mean, it isn't like screaming, you must look at me and be consumed right by me. This isn't the one that hangs over the mantle, right, in the living room. This isn't the one that hangs in the bedroom, right? Those are a little less, those are, you know, a little more welcoming, a little more inviting. This has that kind of sophistication, that openness, and invites um, deeper reflection. And I think that often takes place over um, dinner conversations, right? I could just imagine having a dinner party late into the night on a Friday night like this, and hanging this in the dining room, saying, oh, yeah, this is... A Nasreen Mohammedi, 1963, in Bahrain, the Arabian Gulf, produced this exceptional work of art, bought by Peggy and Robert. Phenomenal, right? Phenomenal. <laughs> Let's just take a moment to uh, drink our tea and sip this in, right? <clears throat> Mm. I could really, really see this hanging on the wall. Mm. As a matter of fact, I'm going to make myself a promise that one day I will have a Nasreen Mohimedi hanging in my dining room. 
Maybe it will be this one. Maybe it will be another one. But I'm going to make this goal today, right? Let me get this. Let me get this tea. Let's make it official. Okay. So let's make a toast, right? Let's make a promise that one day we will have a Nasreen Mohammedi hanging in our dining rooms. Namaste. Exceptional. Anyway, so uh, that was our time together. It was nice hanging with you. Now you still have time to go uh, check out, you know, some Netflix. But uh, hope you enjoyed it, right? Thanks. Thank you, uh, Stark80. Appreciate it. Anyway, enjoy your nights. Enjoy. Go browse some art. Check out some more Nasreen Mohammedi. All right, everybody. Take care. Namaste. <laughs>